Okay, we talked about a gearbox, remember that? And I got myself confused when I said, okay, think about it. Did anybody think about it? I didn't think so. Okay, you remember what we were doing? We had a uh, motor and we plotted torque versus speed. And this was for a motor. And for a DC permanent magnet motor, I don't expect you to memorize this, but for a DC permanent magnet motor, these curves are straight lines. Okay, so I could give you the maximum speed, I can give you the maximum torque, and you can create your own graph. Remember that? And then we had something called an operating point. Yeah, what, how do you find the operating point? Uh, nope. Depending on your load. It depends on the load, right? What you do is you come in with another graph for your load. So this would be torque of the load, speed of the load. They tend to go up like this. Not necessarily a straight line. They could be bent. They could be all kinds of crazy things. So like the classic example is a, is a pump. Pump curves are never really straight. They're all kind of, they're crazy. They're crazy. And loads on uh, fluid systems, they're, they're usually quadratic. Right? They've got usually a minimum head. Remember the example, you're going to pump to the top of the, the roof. You've got to have at least that much pressure to get to the top of the roof. And then the more water you squirt out of the hose at the top, the more pressure you, you need then. Does that make sense? And it's usually quadratic. Okay, so they're rarely ever straight lines. Why do I use straight lines in this class? Because <laughs> the math is easy. Okay? The math, that's really the only reason. And fortunately, DC motors are like this, and it's just the way they are. How do you find the operating point if you have these two curves? You lay them on top of each other and find the intersection. So what you do is you, you pick up this graph right here, right? You make sure it's scaled the same, and then you lay it right on top of this other one right here. And what's that intersection point called? The operating point. So on the final exam, if I ask you for an operating point and I give you two graphs, even though they're not straight, can you find the operating point? That's what's important, right? It's the operating point. That's the, right? It's not DC motor. You all say DC motors are on the well. They could be pumps. What was important about this? Operating point. They all have operating points. You know how to find it, right? Yeah? Yes, you all know how to find the operating point. It's not hard. So if I give you a, a, an exam question where this guy here is a circle, you remember the equation of a circle? Yeah, x squared plus y squared equals radius squared. Okay, so I'll say, okay, torque squared plus speed squared equals 4. You could maybe find the intersection point, couldn't you? I bet you could, right? So if you see something that's not straight, so what? If I ask you for an operating point, you know what an operating point is, right? Okay, so you can do these problems, right? Yes, okay. Now, where I got confused was on the uh, speed reducer, right? I had it all worked out, but I couldn't find it in my notes, and I panicked. You, you've known the feeling, haven't you? Yeah, Okay, good. So, hey, we're human, right? I panicked, too. So anyway, here was the deal on, the, on the, uh, the equations, right? We had a speed reducer. N was the, the amount of reduction. N is bigger than 1, right? If a speed increaser, well, then N would be less than 1, however you want to view it, right? Because you can increase the speed, you can decrease the speed, right? I did a speed reducer. Do you remember the formula for the load speed from a speed reducer? Yeah, if it was a reducer, it would have been omega of the motor divided by N. Remember that? I derived that one. I got that one right. I got them all right. I just didn't know where they came from. I got confused. You remember that one? And it's in your notes, right? <coughs> okay. What was the formula that we had for the torques? You remember the torques? We did that, you know, a little gear and a big gear. And we had the meshing force F. Okay, so it went like this. The torque, torque of the load 
right? Let's see, let's do it real quick. Here was a little gear, here was a big gear. Remember, we had this meshing force here and a meshing force there, remember that? And it was like torque of the motor was equal to the meshing force times the radius of the gear. And then we summed uh, moments on the load and we got load torque was equal to the meshing force, equal and opposite, they were the same, but the radius was a little bit bigger. Remember that? So the load torque is equal to N times FR. FR is motor torque. So the load is equal to N times motor torque, right? Yes or no? All right, the motor torque is FR. The load torque, right? Load, the motor torque was FR. The meshing force times the radius of the, gear, of the gear, yeah? The load torque, well, the gear was a little bit bigger. So F times R is motor torque. So load is equal to N times FR. You need it scrolled up? How's that? Good? Okay, then what I, just to keep it simple, I said, okay, suppose your load was equal to some number, a constant, times the speed. Right? Just to keep it simple. And then I, and then I just said, oh, I got confused, and I just, here's the answer. <laughs> okay, I want to find the operating point when I have a gearbox. I need to plot the load in right the load curve on top of the motor curve I need to plot this guy on top of this guy that's how you find operating points got it okay they're different units Omega motor is not the same as Omega load because there's a gearbox so what I want to do is convert the load equation into a motor equation got it okay do you only do this for straight lines no. Whatever you have, you've got to convert it into the same set of units, the same nomenclature. Is it easy? Not necessarily. Is it easy on the exam? It better be. Or you're going to spend four hours just doing one problem, right? Now, when they're paying you by the hour or whatever, when they're paying you, it's okay to take that time to do it right. For an exam, I gotta I gotta boil it down to something simple. That's why I'm using straight lines. But the idea is the same. Everybody okay? All right. So I want to convert this into motor. Do you have a formula for omega L equals something with omega M? What? Omega M over N, right? Okay. So I'm gonna plug that in. So TL <coughs> equals B. Omega L, okay, that is omega motor over N. Halfway there. Do you have a formula that relates torque load and torque motor? Right there. Let's plug that in. N, whoops, N torque motor, that's torque load, equals B speed motor over N. Solve for TM. B speed N squared. See the N squared? I didn't lie to you. I even confessed to you. I forgot. I'm confused. I don't know. Uh, right? I didn't lie to you. It's N squared. Are you surprised at the n squared? Most people are. They think you put a speed reducer in there, it just cuts it by n. No, it cuts it by n squared. So what's the effect? Well, the effect is I'm going to plot this. This is my load. This is the equation for the load, right? I'm going to plot it on top of the motor. What's the slope? of? The, it's a straight line. You agree? What's the slope of this straight line? It's B divided by N squared. Isn't that the slope? 
n is bigger than one. It's a speed reducer, remember? n is bigger than one. It's a speed reducer. Okay, so I'm going to plot it. Without the speed reducer, if this is the load, that would be a slope of b over 1. If there was no speed reducer in there, I plot 1 right on top of the... Why? Because if there's no speed reducer, omega the load is omega the motor. They're connected directly. If there's no speed reducer, the torque that's generated on the motor gets passed straight over to the load. So there's no conversion required. Boom, there you go. That's the, the slope was B. What is it now with the speed reducer? The slope is lower than it was before. B divided by a bigger number. So the slope is less slope. It's less steep. It's going to come down. right? So now it's going to look like this in the blue one. It's going to look like this. Right? So, let me summarize. What's the effect of putting a speed reducer on the operating point? It lowers what? The torque and increases what? The speed. In general, that's what it does. You know this. You've ridden bicycles. I'm not going to ask you, if you who's not ridden a bicycle. A little bit, okay. You've all ridden bicycles, and if not, Tell me after class, I'll bring a bicycle in and let you ride it. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, you've ridden bicycles. You get tired. You downshift. Right? That means you got a big sprocket on the back and a little sprocket on the front. What do you feel? Let's say you're on the same road that you've always been on. I'm just tired. I downshift. What do you feel? What do I feel? Less resistance. I feel less resistance. Why do you mean less? Well, I don't push as hard. Right? My effort goes down. Isn't that what happens here? You're the motor, right? What does the motor feel? What do your legs feel? When you downshift, you get a speed reducer, right? Big sprocket on the back. What do you feel? You feel less force. That's what's happening. You see that? The motor feels less force. What, do you, what about the speed of your feet? You're going to keep going the same speed. you got to pedal faster. You pedal less hard but faster to go the same speed, right? <laughs> Isn't that what happens? That's what it's showing you that happens, okay? Is your power point halfway of your speed? Probably not. Is it halfway for a DC motor? Yes, why? Because it's a straight line. It, it's just, that's the way it is. Is the maximum power point for an internal combustion engine half the speed? No. Why not? Because it's not a straight line. It's some weird, crazy curve. Depends on your throttle position and all that kind of mess, right? So you can't, re you can't memorize that the maximum power is one half. It is for a DC motor, right? It is for a DC motor. It's not for everything. How did I find it? You remember how I found it? Oh, this is my, my grandson. I ah, just love you. Okay. <laughs> He's just my newest. Okay. I've got others. I love them until they get the teenagers. Then they're, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know where I was going with this. One half the speed, it's one half the speed is your maximum power because it's a straight line. They will all have maximum power points. You don't know where they are, but you can find them, right? You find, how did I find this one? I took torque times speed, power, and I maximized it. Why was I able to do it? Because it was a nice, easy formula. If it's not an easy formula, you can't do it. Clear? OK. So final exams, operating points. You say DC motors, but it's really operating points. Right? I've just given you one example of a DC motor. OK, what's the effect of a gearbox? Re speed reduction lowers the, the Changes the op it'll change the operating point. In this example, it pulled it down. Will it always pull them down? I'm not sure. Maybe Newton had a fifth law. I don't know. I don't know if they always pull down, but they change. That's the whole idea. In this example, if I had a speed increaser, what would happen to the slope? It would go up. Right? Speed increaser would be n is less than 1. So you divide by something less than one, the number becomes bigger, you have a larger slope. 
become steeper. Why do you want a speed increaser, speed reducer? Well, if this is the maximum power, and if that's what you're trying to achieve is maximum power delivery, then what you want is you want your operating point at that maximum power point. That may or may not be what you want, right? Depends. Make sense? Somebody had a question. Um, so in speed reducer, your T-load will be greater than your T-motor, right? You're increasing the torque on your output. <laughs> Let me see. What does the equation tell me? Because that's all I know. Yeah, right there. See it, circle? So the torque of the load is, is larger than the motor. Torque of the load is larger. Larger than the motor. Look at this right here. See, this has got a bigger one, right? So if you apply a, you know, if you apply a torque here to generate that force, that force is the same as that force, but then you're going to get more torque on the load. Does that make sense? Because of the radius. Huh? Because of the radius. Right. Now, not all gearboxes are made up of two gears. Very seldom are they made up of two gears. But the idea is the same. You're reducing the speed. It's just, it's hard to visualize all the internal forces. You can do it, but what you'll find is that it's, it's uh, it, it follows the same ratio. If you, if you decrease the speed, you increase the torque. All right. One goes down, one goes up. Okay, speed reducers, DC motors, operating points. Uh, you want a quiz? <laughs> okay. Which one of these is the motor? Straight line is the motor? How do you know? Yeah, because if it goes on forever, right? If it goes on forever, then this thing right here is going to represent infinite power because power is equal to the, the effort times the motion, right? If it's, if it's electronics, it's voltage times current. If it's a pump, it's uh, pressure times flow. If it's mechanical, it's force times speed or torque times rotation speed, right? It's always one variable times the other one, always, okay? So, uh, so this guy would be what you would love to have, right? That would give you an infinite amount of power. They just don't exist. I mean, it'd be great, but they don't, right? So this one here, is, if I had to guess, I'd say, well, this is, this has got to be the, you know, now if, if I said, no, I'm fooling you, because really I didn't show you all the data, and the data really looks like this. Okay, well, now I don't know. Okay? But on a test, I'm going to show you everything. Okay. So that's the low. Okay, is this going to operate? No. Why not? Yeah, your, your motor cannot produce, at any point, it cannot produce the torque that's required to run it. Got it? Okay, how about something like this? Uh, let's see. Will this start? It will? Where is the motor? The curve is the motor, right? So this is the motor? It'll start. Okay, so at first the velocity is equal to zero, correct? So you're right here. How much torque is the motor producing? How much do you need? Is it going to start? It's demanding five PSI, and you've got three PSI. Will it? If you want me to move, you got to push me, right? Where could this come from? Well, this could come from uh, friction. Right? You gotta overcome the friction, then I'll move. It could be coming from a pipe, right? And I've gotta pump it to the roof, right? I've gotta have at least that much pressure to get it to the roof, and I may not be able to produce that, 
right? So what I'd say, well, the graph is telling me that at zero speed, I don't have very much. But it's demanding that you give me this much or else I'm in, I ain't gonna do anything. This will not run, this will not start. <laughs> Suppose you got it started somehow. Somebody came along and they, you know, kind of shoved it along and you got to move it. <coughs> Would it operate? Where do you think it would operate? <coughs> There's two places it looks like, right? Looks like it might operate here. Might operate here. Which one do you think it'll do? Why? These are steady state plots, right? They don't tell you anything about the transient. But you know about transients, right? Transients, everything's got time constant, uh, right? Suppose you got it started a little bit, right? What are the odds it's going to hit exactly that speed? Probably not likely. But suppose you got there. What if you were just a little bit too fast? What would it tend to do? Bring it back down. Would it bring it back down? If you were a little bit too fast in the operating point. A little bit too fast, right? Because it, you know, in the transient, you're going just a wee bit too fast. You're going a wee bit too fast, aren't you over here? Isn't the motor giving you more torque than what you need? What do you do when you get more force than what you need? You accelerate, don't you? You speed up, right? Pumps do the same thing. Motors do the same thing. Circuits do the same thing. All right, you're gonna speed up, okay? If you're gonna speed up, which way are you gonna head? To the right. So you're gonna head over this way. Maybe you have some inertia, right? The inertia is going to cause a transient. Okay, you're going to overshoot, maybe, right? So if you overshoot, what happens here? Yeah, now all of a sudden you can't provide the, the torque that you need. You're going to kind of slow down a little bit. So you're going to kind of maybe like this, maybe. Maybe you use in, I don't know. Does you get the, the difference? Wouldn't it turn it off? Huh? Wouldn't it turn it off? Would it turn it off? Okay, what if you, in other words, if you slow down a little bit? What would happen if you slowed down a little bit? Now you have more torque than you need. What are you going to do? So you're going to do this. No, but if you overshoot it, like if you go over it. Big time? Yeah. Okay, now what happens? You overshoot big time. Boom, over here. Okay, what happens now? Yeah, you're gonna slow down, right? Maybe you shoot, maybe you shoot way over here and it stops. I, I don't know, it depends on the transient. You can't really get a lot of information, but all I'm pointing out is you can get some. This guy here is gonna to tend to be unstable, right? Even if you could get it there, is it gonna stay there? Probably not, right? It's either gonna, you know, if somebody slows it down just a wee bit, it's gonna, it's gonna stop. But at this point you have less torque than what you need. At this point, you have less torque than what you need. So what do you do? You're slow here. Down. You're going to okay. slow down, right? Slow down. Boom. Now, if you have a whole bunch of inertia and somehow you ended up way over here, then yeah, maybe the transient is going to pull you all the way over here and, hit, uh, and then you stop. Right? <coughs> you can't get that much information off of this, but you can at least tell that sometimes they're stable and sometimes they're not. Yeah, so what would happen? So if I, on an exam, say if you started right, if somebody got you here, what are you going to do? You're going to go there. And then, yeah, you hope you settle it. But again, this is not a transient plot. This is a steady state plot. So like he's pointing out, maybe you got so much inertia, it carries you all the way over here. You know, I, I don't know, because that's the transient. But, this, but you'll tend to head that direction. Right? Make sense? Yeah, you had a question. Um, so if we just look at just the, the first intersection there, couldn't that be like a graph of your car's engine? Because you need the starter. You can push on the gas, but it won't start. You know, so yeah. You need the starter. Yeah, Eng engines, I, I'm not an expert on engines. I know that they look weird and they do hump up like this and then mm -hmm. drop off big time. And I do know that they have very little torque at the very beginning mm -hmm. when they're running slow speed. That's why in a manual transmission, you got a clutch hold the clutch in so that you release the the you don't need as much effort well, and I guess yeah. the bigger question is then couldn't that, that 
if we got rid of the second point and just looked at the first point, couldn't that still work? Because you know, like your engine needs something external to start it. It doesn't start on its own. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. You, I don't know. Yeah. There's a lot of things I don't know. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm at the end of my career. I don't need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, I'm recording this. Oh, my God. <laughs> Let's say, yo, Lewis, you're at the end of your career. We don't need to give you a raise. Damn. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know how to answer your question. Anything else? All right. Let's do something else. Block diagrams. Okay. I don't like block diagrams, but the person who teaches mechatronics does. And uh, he got on me one time. And I realize I'm senior, you know, it's friendly. He says, I cover block diagrams, and, you know, I think it should be okay. So here we go. Here's some block diagrams. You ready? I don't like them because I don't like drawing pictures. But let me draw you a block diagram. Let's, let me show you how to diagram an equation, okay? That might be the easiest thing. What we're going to do is we're going to use two different uh, symbols. One is going to be a circle. This is going to be a summer. It's going to have multiple arrows coming in. It can have as many as you want. Okay. On each arrow, it's going to have a plus or a minus sign. Plus, minus, plus. And it will have one arrow going out. The formula for this is a simple addition and subtraction. So if you have something like a variable x going in, you have a y going in and a z going in, three numbers, I bet you can guess the output. The output is going to be positive x minus y plus z. See how easy that is? Now, why do we draw it as a circle? I don't know. Nobody asked me. It's a circle. Okay? That's the formula for circles. Simple, right? We also have squares or rectangles or whatever. What goes inside the rectangle is a transfer function. Okay? So what goes in here is a transfer function. So I'll write a real simple transfer function. 1 over s. Does it look like a transfer function? Why does it look like a transfer function? Because it's got S's in there, right? It's got a numerator, it's got a denominator, there's a transfer function. These guys have one guy coming in, one guy going out. If X comes in and Y goes out, the formula for Y is X divided by S. See how easy that is? So the formula for a box is what's in the box times the name of the guy coming in. Piece of cake? All right. The last thing that we have is what, I, I don't know what they call them, but I call them pick-off points. If you have an arrow and there's a dot here, something comes off this guy right here. If this is X, coming off the arrow over here is X, coming off here is X. It's all the same. It's kind of like measuring voltages. Uh, well, it goes in, so it's coming out of something. I guess I should draw it as a box, right? So let's say there's a box here. So it's coming out of the box, and you have a pickoff point. Then what that is is this thing here is whatever is coming out of there, right? And it's not like everything has to go left to right. Sometimes they'll draw them backwards. They'll do it like this. And in this case, that box is six. Uh, you, if, if X is what's coming out of the box, then X is, if X is what's coming out, then X is what's there. In other words, you just grab it and pull it back. Okay. Why? Because this is the way everybody has agreed that when I draw you a diagram, this is what I mean. Okay. It's just convention. It's what we do. What are we using for? I don't use it for anything. Didn't I say that? <laughs> Uh, I'll show you. Some people are very graphical and they want to see a picture of, right? I like to look at the equations because I like to punch them into Mathematica. 
right? Mm -hmm. Other people like to look at the picture and say, oh, I see what your problem is. Now, how do they do that? I don't know, man, right? I, I'm, not, I'm not that way, I'm not visual, which, which is amazing because the, the, the thing that I'm most famous for and get called on is a, is a graphical solution to something I did. I'm not visual, <laughs> you know, anyway. Maybe you'll see why, okay? I've just got to cover it, okay? Let's come up with some equations. Let's make up some equations, and I'm going to draw a diagram of them, okay? How about something like this? S squared x plus S uh, x plus 3 x equals 4. Is that good? Start off simple. Okay, what kind of equation is that? Quadratic or transfer. Okay, it, it, it's going to be a transfer function, but it's not yet, right? It's a Laplace transform of a differential equation. How do I know it's a differential equation? Well, I mean, I guess I could have just said I'm going to use S, right? Hopefully you realize S is the Laplace guy, right? Okay, in this class, S is the Laplace guy. How do I know this is a differential equation? Yeah, because this is an x double dot. That's where you got the s squared. You get the connection? Okay. So this is x dot, and that's 3x equals 4. Okay. What's the output variable for that equation? It's the highest order. So which one is that? X. Now, I probably should have called it y instead of 4, but okay. What would be the input? The 4 is the input. Everybody got it? Okay. I want to draw a diagram of this guy. Okay, so how could I do that? Draw a diagram of this guy. Square root of four. Huh? Start with a square root of four inside. Okay, all right, so start with a four. Okay, uh, all right. I won't say no. Now what? Well, that's the output, right? That was the input, I thought we said. Let me, tell you, let me show you what I would do. How about that? Maybe that'll help. Maybe that'll help, right? I know I can have boxes with transfer functions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the transfer function for this equation. Okay? So the transfer function for this guy is going to be output over input. I'll call it uh, input, I-N. That's going to be equal to 4 over, uh, let's see, well, 1, I guess, and we'll put the input over here. S squared plus S plus 3. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a box, and I'm going to put that equation in there. 1 over S squared plus S plus 3. What should go into that box? A 4. Okay, so I'm going to run a 4 in here. What comes out of the box? Very good. Can you see that or no? Right? So what you have is this guy right here, the transfer function. What's the output? The output of the transfer function is x. That's what comes out of the box. What goes into the box? That thing right there, which was the 4. Could you also write it like this? Y'all are so demanding. No, you couldn't write that. Yeah, That would change the input, wouldn't it? Okay. Depends on, you know, like for example, you say, well, four is the input. No, one's the input, and I multiply by four. It's all kind of the same, isn't it? But is the equation the same? Yeah. Okay. So it, you, block diagrams are not unique because I've just showed you two ways to write the same stupid thing. Did I? What good are they? I don't use them. Four. Okay, it depends on what you want to call as the input. You could say the input is a one, and I'm going to scale it by four. So my transfer function is four over this, and the input is x over one. So 
or, or x is the output, one is the input. Or I can do it like this and say, no, one is the numerator, four is the input. It's all up to you, right? So the way you want to look at it and view it. Point is, they're not unique. There's not just one way you can do it. You could write it as a two and a two. What's important is that what comes out of here is the same thing as the formula, right? You make it a 2.5 and a whatever. Wouldn't that also be four over s squared plus s? Well, this is the same, s squared plus s plus three. And after that, the output, you put x on it? Okay, uh, what's the output? What's the output here? Four over s. Four times one over this. Right, because you know, how do you find the outcome of a box? You take what's in the box and multiply it by the input, right? So you take this times that to get x. Do the same thing, this times that, do you get the same thing? Yes, you do. The point is, it's not unique. But the outcome is the same, got it? Okay, so if I put this on an exam and somebody writes this, and somebody writes this, how many points do I take off? None, because they're the same thing. <coughs> Got it? So far okay? Okay, you can also build them in a very crazy way. Right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna take a box, and I'm gonna take one over S squared. Oops, excuse me, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna, let me get a sheet, new sheet of paper. Okay, the equation was s squared uh, x plus s times x plus three times x equals four. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take a box, I'm gonna put s squared. I'm gonna put x in. What do I have coming out? X S squared. Then I'm going to take another box. I'm going to put S. I'm going to take a pick off and I'm going to put it in there. What have I got coming out of there? Everybody right? X S? Then I'm going to take a number three. Take a pick off. Stick him in here. What do I got coming out? Then I'm going to take a summer. Stick that in there. What do I want? Okay. Stick this guy in. What do I want? What do I want to put there? And what do I have coming out? That's a, that's a valid diagram for that equation. It's a stupid diagram for that equation. Because what's coming out? Yeah, four. Do you ever solve for the input? No. Plus the fact that what's got to go in? X. Where are you going to get it? Dumb, isn't it? But you can build them up? Yeah? You can? Okay. All right, let's do another problem. Let's do one like this. Um, S squared plus 2S plus 1, bless you, X minus S plus 1 y equals r and uh, s uh, plus 3 y uh, equals uh, x. Let's draw the diagram of that. You ready? Okay. What's the output for the first equation? X. How do you know it's x? The highest derivative. Highest derivative. So this guy's going to be an output of x. So what I'm going to try and do is get a box that has x coming out. What's the output for the second equation? 
What is it? Why? What if I were to do this? Let me change the color. S times X. Huh? Why is it still Y? They're the same derivatives. You never use two equations to solve for one variable. Right? So if, if you didn't see that, if that was the first one on the top of the exam, and you looked at that, you'd say, well, it's either Y or X. You don't know which, right? Okay? So let's, let's say you make a commitment. You say, it's X. Then you suddenly see this one. What do you conclude? You were wrong, right? So what you want to do is look on the ones that's obvious. This guy's obviously X. This one, not so much, right? But it can't be X. Why not? You already got one for X. You don't use two equations to solve for this. It's wasteful, right? I don't know any other reason. It's wasteful. Everett's first law, don't waste. <laughs> uh, my daughter's an you know, environmentalist. She'll tell you, don't waste. Okay, sorry. Gotcha. Okay, but let's get rid of the S. Keep it simple. Let's get rid of the S. Here we go. So the output for this guy is Y. Okay, so I'm going to have, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw two boxes. One that's going to get me X coming out, one that's going to get me Y coming out. So here we go. So here we go. Uh, here's, a, here's a box. This is going to be X coming out. And here's a box. And I got Y coming out. Okay, what do I need to put in the box for the Y? <coughs> do I put X in the box? No, because no, it's a variable, right? So it's out there on the outside somewhere. What do you want to put in? 1 over S plus 3. So what I'll do is I'll put in a 1 over S plus 3. How did you know it was 1 over S plus 3? What did you do? Yeah, you're going to get the transfer function, right? Output over input. That's what goes in there, right? So if you're looking at this going, how in the hell did he know that? Well, find the transfer function. What's the transfer function for this guy? Output over input, right? What's the output? Y? Okay, then the other guys must be the input. So it's output over input equals, what is it? One, that's why he knew it was a one. Over S plus three. That's what goes in the box. So far okay? It's not hard, you just have to think about it, right? I, I, I believe. I, I don't believe it's hard, I think you just have to kind of yeah, I find that transfer function. And then you stick it in the box. Okay, what goes in? What arrow? X, okay. I need an arrow named X to put it in there. What goes in this top box? Need a bigger box, okay. Need a bigger boat, <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, how would you find out? R is going to be the input. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to start with an R. This one's a little trickier. I'm going to start with an R. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a summer right here. I'm going to put a plus on him. So I have an R. And then I'm going to put a box here, and I'm going to put a S plus 1. <laughs> and I'm going to stick a Y in there. And what do I have coming out? S plus 1 times Y, right? I have that term coming out. See that? So what am I going to do with that guy? What do you think? What comes out of that? Wouldn't it be added? Oh, crap, you're right. Who said negative? You flunked. <laughs> Do you see why it's a positive? Okay, I'm trying to build up this. I, you know, I'm trying to solve for x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this times x equals r plus that. Okay, just skip the steps. So s plus 
1 times y plus r is what? All of that this. That's equal to this, isn't it? S squared plus 2s plus 1 times x. I want x coming out. What do I have to do? Right, divide by that, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to divide by 1 over s squared plus 2s plus 1. What do I have coming out? <coughs> got to connect them together. I've got an x coming out. Who needs an x? So I'm going to pick him off. Throw him in there. Who needs a Y? Pick him off. Stick him in there. What? Isn't that right? Yeah. I pick off the Y, shove him in there. Pick off the X, stick him in there. Right? Now, what you do is you rearrange the boxes so it looks nice and neat. That's the part I don't like. Tedious, monotonous, but that's a block diagram for that equation. Could you do it? So is that supposed to help you solve for what each one's worth? That's the next thing coming up. You see what I did? I know my two outputs are x's and y's. So I'm gonna, what I do is I start with two boxes, x and y. So basically, you just turn everything into one variable, right? Like you put it, you solve for y, then you plug that into y, so you get x. Yep. I'll do another example in a, in a minute. I mean, this is a little mind-boggling. I, I I realize, but I mean, it's kind of like solving crossword puzzles. You got to think about it sometimes. Now, you know, normally the way I teach is I say there's three ways you do it, right? You don't want to have step one, step two, step three? I don't have steps on this. Why do you think? Because I don't use it. <laughs> so I don't have 30 years of experience to say step one, step two, step three. This is the best I'm going to be able to do. I'll do some more examples. You make up a pro uh, an ex uh, some equations and I'll diagram it for you, okay? And I'll do it over and over and over until you say, okay, I got it. I don't know how you're going to learn it other than doing just doing it a couple times. Okay? All right. Everybody ready? I'm going to do something else. I'm going to show you something else. Okay, once you have the diagram, I'm going to show you what you normally use it for. And I think I need to add some pages. Okay, let's start with a diagram. So I'm going to have a diagram here. I'm making one up. One over S. Uh, put another one here. Uh, two over S plus one. Uh, I'm going to grab this guy. I'm going to bring here. This is going to be um, three times s. And this would be r. Okay. Got it? So far okay? This would be a typical diagram of something called a feedback, right? What will happen is, let's say this is an automobile or whatever, these, these will come from <coughs> differential equations for your Mars rover with a DC motor attached, okay? Something like that. So you have a DC motor pushing your Mars rover. This might be the position of your Mars rover based on the voltage that you apply. So what I'm gonna do is I wanna control my uh, Mars rover. So what I'll do is I'll measure the position 
I'll run it through a function, I'll come back and I'll compare it to what I want him to do. I want you to be three feet, you're not at three feet, then I'm going to apply a control for you. All right, so this is a, called a, a feedback loop. You're gonna learn about this in Mechatronic, All right? Does it make any sense? No? Okay. <laughs> let's say let's say I want to build a cruise control for your car. I want to build a cruise control for your car. How do you do that? You can do what is this what you do? You say this is what you do on a motorcycle, at least when I was a motorcycle, which I have no idea what they do now. You you dial up the, the throttle, right? The throttle's up here and you and you tighten the screw. And then you let go and the throttle stays on, right? That was your cruise control. <laughs> now, what happens if that's your cruise control? It makes it a lot harder to brake. <laughs> yeah, you got to take it off. You got to hit the brake. If you if you're on level ground and you're doing 55, that's great. Now all of a sudden I head up Trans Mountain. What's going to happen if I don't adjust it? It starts to slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. Right? Okay. The problem is that you you know that's not the way to build a cruise control. It's just not the way to do it. Right? What do you do? Yeah, what you do is you say, okay, well, I'm going to measure what I want. I want your speed to be 55. I'm going to measure your speed. Okay? I'm going to compare that speed to what I want it to be. You want it to be 55, it's 60. So you have an error. You have five degree, a five mile an hour error, right? So what, what, is, what happens? You back off of the throttle. So you have a sensor that measures what it's doing. You have an actuator that can apply gas, right? Look under the hood. You have you have one that can uh, that can press on your gas pedal. Okay. So what it does is it senses the speed. It says it's not what I want it to be. I'm going to change the gas. Get the idea? It's called a feedback control. So what happens is you have whatever the equation is for your you know for your um, car. It measures the output. It compares it to what you want. It makes a decision and applies the control. Does that make sense? Your toilet does the same thing. You didn't realize you had a feedback control in your toilet, did you? You flush it, right? So you open it up, the water goes out. The valve shuts back down, right? It kind of automatically, boom shuts back down. Why doesn't it overflow? Maybe yours does. Why? It's got a float. So it's got a sensor that measures the level of the water. And what happens when the level of the water comes up? It shuts off the valve so you don't have any more going in. It's a feedback control. Very simple one, but it's a feedback <coughs> control. Make sense? How will you know whether to hit the gas hard or gently when you're building a cruise control. How do you know? Well, it depends, doesn't it? It depends on the, the size of your engine and the weight of your car, doesn't it? So if you got a really lightweight car, got a Mustang, and a high-powered engine, then you probably don't want to goose it too much, right? Because what would happen? You get a one mile an hour under, whoa, and all of a sudden you're 10 miles an hour over, right? Now what you can do is you can buy the Mustang and you can take it out on the road and you can experiment <coughs> and adjust everything so you get a nice cruise control, right? Or you can use the math that he's gonna teach you in mechatronics to calculate what it ought to be as a starting point. Now which one do you think is the smart way to go? The fun way to go is take it out and run it. The smart way to go is to calculate it and say this is what I think it ought to be set it in there and then take it out and run. Okay? All right, so that's the feedback. That's feedback. He's going to cover that in mechatronics. Okay? It's used a lot for a lot of stuff. Okay, here's what I want. I show you a diagram. I would like to have the transfer function. Did I tell you everything you need? No. The transfer function, right? For what output? Well, it depends on what you're interested in, right? Right? For example, maybe this is speed, and maybe that's what I'm interested in. 
Maybe this is engine uh, power. Maybe that's what I'm interested in, right? So when I say I want the transfer function, the first thing you should do is say, of what? You want the transfer function of what? So you pick one. I've got Z labeled, I've got Y labeled. What, should, what do you want? You want the transfer function of what? Z. Z, we'll do Z. Now I'll come back and do Y. I want the transfer function of Z. So what I want is Z divided by the input equals blah, blah, blah. Right? What's the input? Can you look at the diagram and tell me where the input is? R. It's R. How do you know it's R? Because <laughs> it don't come out anywhere. It goes in. I don't calculate that. It goes in. Is, is that a uh, input? 3S? Is this an input? No, because it's calculated. Right? It's calculated. So that could be an output. This could be an output. This could be an output. Could this be an output? No, because it's not calculated. You get the idea? Is it always necessary you have one input? No, you have multiple inputs. So in mechatronics, they've got that, you know, that hovercraft. How many inputs does it have? Four. Have you seen it? It's got four propellers. It's got four inputs. This one, I've got one. Okay. So far, so good. All right. What I want to do then is I want to find the transfer function for this guy. So I'm going, uh, what I want is I want equations that will tell me z equals. Okay, so here we go. I see that z comes out of this box. I'm going to number these things. This is going to be uh, guy number one. This is going to be guy number two. This is going to be guy number three. And this is going to be guy number four. I don't know what to call them. Why not? Because I don't use this. All right? So it's one, two, three, and four. I just numbered them arbitrarily just so I can talk to you about it. Okay, I see that Z is coming out of guy number two, so I'm going to write the equation for that guy. Z equals. What is the formula for that box? One over S. It's 1 over S times whatever's going in. Right? Okay, so it's 1 over S times whatever's going in. Well, what's going in? It's the output from number one. Isn't it? Okay, so I'm going to call it O1, output from one. Is that right? <coughs> well, what the heck is the output of one? Okay, output of one equals R Minus what? 3S. Not 3s. Oh. 3s times. Uh, uh, oh man, I can't deal with this. Oh, it's output of four, isn't it? Now you can go back as far as you can keep it straight in your head. Can I keep things straight in my head? No. no. <laughs> so I say it's output four, isn't it? What's output four? Y times three. You can call it Y if you want. I'm going to call it output three. What's output three? I agree. It is. Output three is doesn't it come out of a box? Yeah, it's two. But didn't you pick it off of just the y there? You could. I'm not going to. Times what? Times Output two or z. <laughs> How many unknowns? Do you know output one? No. Let me use a different color. That's an unknown. Z, do you know Z? No, that's what I'm trying to find. Output 4, you know output 4? No. Output 3, do you know output 3? Output 2? Oh, excuse me, Z? Count it. How many unknowns? 4. How many equations? How many things did you start with? 
One, two, three, four. How many equations I get? You see a rule here? If you got eight things, how many equations are you gonna write? Of what? What is this? Output of what? Thing one. What's this? What's this? Output of what? Thing two. What's this? Output of what? Thing three. What's this? Output of what? Thing four. Right? So what you do is you got four things. Write the output of all four things. Doesn't matter what you're trying to solve for. Who cares? You write four equations. One output from each thing. Yeah. Can you also call it V O two? Yes, I should have. Right? I should have. So what I do is I is if if the you know Angel asks me to do this, this is what I do. I say, okay, one, two, three, four. Output one equals R minus output four. Output two equals one over S times output one. Output three equals two over S plus one, output two. See how easy that is? Output four equals 3s times output three. Boom, 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 boom. Four equations, four unknowns. Then what do I do? Mathematica. Then I do Mathematica. Do you have to use Mathematica? No. If you have 20 boxes, yes don't have to, but you're going to make a lot of mistakes, right? You see how easy it is to get from there to there? Or no? Are they different? <coughs> how can I fool you on an exam? Can I? Cannot fool you, right? Because what are you going to do if there's 22 boxes? You're going to write 22 equations. What if there's three circles instead of just one circle? Is that going to panic you? No. No. What if there are four inputs to a circle? Is that going to panic you? No. What if I've got other boxes? What if I had something like this? Could you do this? I'll pick off of here, and I'll go through here, and I have a, uh, you know, uh, S over S plus 3, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to stick it into a summer, put a negative here, and I'm going to pick off here, and I'm going to show, and then I'm going to take this one out and put it in here. Does that freak you out? No, it doesn't. One, two, three, four, five, six. How many equations are you going to write? Six. You're going to write this one? Is it? Yes, you are. You're going to say output one is R minus output six minus. Output four, you see how easy? Output four equals output one. What are you going to write for this? Output two equals. Right? What are you going to do here? Same thing. What are you going to do here? Uh oh. Output, well, it's one, two, three, four, five. This is five. Output five equals S over times. You're going to follow with that, right? Output three, yeah? Output six. Output six right here equals, what's this? Output four minus output. Now, why are you freaking out? Right. Why are you freaking out? Isn't it, isn't it really that simple? The hard one is going from the equation to the diagram, in my opinion. This one, if you got Mathematica, piece of cake. When you have, oh sorry, when you have different inputs, then what is the consequence? If you have different inputs, okay, he's gonna cover this in his next problems. What you do is you say, uh, just like I say, you want the transfer function of what? Oh, I want it for x, okay, thank you. Relative to what? Oh, I want R, okay, thank you, so I want X over R. If you, let's say you have R1 and R2, and R1 and R2 are inputs. He says he wants a transfer function, I say of what? He says X, I say relative to what? R2, okay, then I want X over R2. Okay, and he'll show you how to do that. Okay? 
Any questions? You want to do another example, or do we have time? Or do you want to review for the final? Yeah. Okay. What if? What if? You know, the the uh, the question was: I want the transfer function for. I want the transfer function for z. Okay. What I would do is I call it 01, 02, 03, 04, blah, 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 right? I'm going to have four unknowns. <laughs> 01, 02, 03, and 04, right? Mathematica will solve four equations for all four unknowns, 01, 02, 03, and 04. You tell me you would like the, uh, the uh, transfer function for Z. I say that's 02. I say Mathematica, copy, paste, I got 02. You tell me, no, 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 I want Y. Okay, that's output three. I copy and paste output three, boom, and I divide by the input, bam, 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 I got them all. All of them that are possible, I got them all. Because I got every single output in Mathematica solved it. Can you do it by hand? Yes, you can, but it's easier to solve for one. If you want them all, you gotta take that one, substitute it back in, get the second guy. Take those two, substitute it back in, get the third guy. Take those three, substitute it back in, get the fourth. So you, you know, you're gonna have to do them one at a time. Mathematica does them all, boom, like that. You really want Mathematica really do. He doesn't allow you to use it. <laughs> Develop better math skills. Okay. Trust me. He knows what he's doing. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Uh, two minutes left anyway. So. Oh, I have some more tickets for the uh, uh, Christmas thing if you want one. Just come get them. The only, the only thing I ask for is if you take it, use it. Don't throw it in the trash. Don't take it if you don't want it. Okay, so I've got some more. Any other questions? When am I going to be back? Friday, Friday afternoon. So if you need something, Friday afternoon. And I'll be here next week. Send me an email if you have a question, and I'll try to respond. Anything else? Anything about <laughs> oh, special topics class. You know, uh, the MSC people said they want me to teach class, right? I don't have time to teach a class, but we've got this two-week period. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. I'm asking how many people want to do it. Now, it's not up to me. What I do is I say there's 30 people, 20, whatever. Let's say they would like to take it. Then the people who count the money will say, we can do it, we can't do it, we can whatever. I don't know how they make the decision, but they do. They'll make a decision and say, it doesn't matter. I don't care if 200 people want it. I can't do it, right? It won't be all uh, and and if, if they let it be done, then they'll do it. Now, I understand there's two, right? Isn't there a, there's a, already a spacecraft dynamics, I think? And then I was thinking about doing an ad. I didn't realize they had spacecraft dynamics. Odds are they're not going to do both. Because what will happen is whoever's here is going to get split between the two. It's less money. Because it's all, it, you know, they got to pay me out of tuition, right? <coughs> and, uh, and so odds are they won't do two. So whoever this is, makes that decision will probably, I, I, I don't know, because I don't make it, will probably say it's either this one or that one. And, and somebody will make a decision based on the money. What is it, Adams. They want me to teach Adams. I'll teach Adams in two weeks. You come in there, open up your computer. We're going to build a model that does whatever. In the winter or two weeks. And it starts January. What is the date on that? So put all the online stuff. What online stuff? All the online stuff. Oh, it's been opened up, I think. Oh, yeah, but I wonder when we have to finish all the online stuff. Finish the outline. No, the online. Oh, online uh, stuff. you have until the 12th. Until yeah, Friday. The day of the exam. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's cool. And I think it's open until midnight, but I'm not certain. Oh, okay. I just know it's the 12th. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank
you were going to send me an email about, about the book? his book. You want it? Yeah. I have it right now. What do, what do you got? Do you have a USB something? Uh, yes. Yeah. It's not a. It's not a uh, iPad. Of course I have a USB. Yeah, that's, <laughs> right. that's what they advertise now. I have a USB. <laughs> Dr. Everett, when is the homework closing for this class? The 12th. Yeah, but I can't tell you if it's noon or midnight, but it's the 12th. Okay. Today is the final. This, if not, it's in my left. Let's try it out. Where do I put it? It's right here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, better turn this.